Good morning, everybody. My name is Dr. Patrick Flynn, and welcome to this morning's A Different Perspective. I'm always so excited to be here with you live on these Saturday mornings. Thank you so much. I want to tell you that from the bottom of my heart. The influx of messages that has come into our Facebook, our emails, and all of our media platforms has been absolutely um, uh, just overwhelmingly good. And what I mean by that is this, is the consistent questions that we now can actually share a perspective with you that has been actually affecting people all over the world. So I wanna thank you. I want it to from the bottom of my heart. I just wanna say thank you because if it wasn't for you guys, this information couldn't get out there. I promise you, I will spend all of my time on a consistent basis um, working with our docs and bringing you guys the greatest information so you can have a choice. See, I actually had a message last night that I was sitting just discussing even with my wife. This person actually sent me, and it was a guy. I'm actually kind of, I'm kind of floored that I'm actually getting more of a male following now than ever before. Now, it's Durham. It's predominantly female, okay? Because women do actually take a little bit more interest in their health. But I actually had a, a guy that sent me a very, very nice message. And he goes, Doc, I got one question for you. Why do you do it? It's simple. Today's topic is a perfect representation of what's gonna happen today because if you fall apart health-wise, it's both emotional for both a female but also a male. I continually, um, for years and years, sometimes went home in emotional tears, just like a lot of our doctors do, from the sad suffering that what couples actually go through. Um, imagine this, uh, and, it, and it relates to our topic today. You know, Let's say that you did have breast cancer, which is our topic. Um, and you know somebody that, that dramatically suffers from it. It's very emotionally, for both a male and female, very devastating. And I want to say this today, as a practitioner on today's topic of breast cancer, I do want you to understand, I'm going to put myself in everybody's shoes today. Shoes from, once again, the person that may have breast cancer. You may have it right now. Emotionally, you know, it's, it's very devastating. Second of all, you might have a loved one that currently has it. Maybe a mom, maybe a sister, maybe a grandma. Um, once again, I want to put myself in the perspective that you are uh, watching these people suffer. But I also want to share my condolences, but also understand, put myself in the shoes that maybe somebody has lost somebody to breast cancer. I've not been there, okay? Yes, obviously, we deal with people that have breast cancer every single day with all the wellness ways. And so, therefore, emotionally, I can actually really connect with them. But I'm also going to put myself today in the perspective as a patient, but also the MDs themselves, because I get consistent calls now more than ever from doctors um, that repeatedly say, this woman's going through breast cancer. Um, consistent treatment has been not good for her. You know, what can be done? And they're kind of looking for an alternative treatment to what is out there today. And some of you guys may have tuned in today saying, man, I, I hope Dr. Patrick really gives us some good alternatives to a form of treatment of current breast cancer standards today. My, that's not my job. The only alternative I'm going to give you today is an alternative perspective, an alternative thinking. Because if that doesn't come forth, everything I say is going to be put in the same thinking that dominates today, which is medical thinking which I call the fire department thinking. So we're gonna go through things a little bit in detail today. So I apologize, but I wanted to actually pull up, obviously, as you know, I like referencing the current medical thinking today and seeing where it's going to lead people. See, that's the whole idea of their perspective. I'm gonna show you their perspective and how it's you know, shown out to the public, and then I'm gonna give you a different perspective. And like I said, because it's different, I believe that I have to you know, actually uh, lead you to the evidence that helped me not only understand breast cancer in a very different way, but also come up with a platform to actually have people that have been through breast cancer, currently going through it, but more importantly, don't want to get it in the first place. All right? So from that perspective, let's start here, okay? Breast cancer. It's, um, the statistics are absolutely astonishing when you actually look at them. So let's say, let's put ourselves in the perspective of a person maybe that just recently got diagnosed. And those stats are actually staggering. So let's look at your person right now. Um, you're going to obviously get information from a doctor. But the one thing I love about today's people 
is because of technology, is because of smartphones, because of all of the things that, that uh, people can get information from, when a doctor gives them an opinion, what they can now do is they can now go to different references and actually sift through it. And people say, well, doc, you know, you know, how do you actually sift through, you know, what's true and what's not? You know, I personally believe this. You know, people say, you know, going back to that guy asked me, why do you do a different perspective? Why do you put out so much material? And why do you put it in such long format? Well, the reason why is this. I believe that I can create the argument to the direction that it's going today and give you a totally different perspective, and maybe that can change you and go into a different direction. Not an alternative treatment, but alternative thinking, which now leads to different actions. So let's look at basically one of the major websites that actually people reference to. I'm gonna take the two most. Um, and we're gonna actually see you know, what they're saying. So put yourself, and so if you're a male, put yourself in the perspective of a female that actually recently got diagnosed with breast cancer or is very fearful of it that way. So they're gonna do the research. And then let's walk through what they're kind of saying and see what conclusions we kind of come to. So, and we just go to you know, breastcancer.org, which is a very you know, uh, research site that way, um, researched by people. So here we go, U U.S. breast cancer statistics. And I, I actually, these are pretty commonly known across the, the United States, right? But I want you to think about this. About one in eight U.S. women will develop invasive breast cancer. Okay, now there's all stages of breast cancer. You know, there's actually one through four, but it just means, for example, once again, is it invasive, growing, spreading, and a, a, a one is not, it's more localized, four, it's actually can spread all over the body. But invasive, once again, is not good, okay? One out of eight. Picture this, I have a lot more than eight women employees. Statistically, if things continue the way they are, one out of eight women will actually be diagnosed with it. That statistic continues to narrow, okay? I can remember when I started practice, it was like one in 25, then one in 18, and then one in 11, and, and it continued to go down. And that's why if you look at what they focus on to bring out to the public, is actually kind of somewhat of false hope, okay? So now, in, in 2019 alone, they figure roughly 270,000 new cases are gonna be found, okay? And roughly 65,000 roughly of non-invasive breast cancer. Now think about that. So over 300,000 new cases just are uh, estimated what they've already got for statistics already, but also this year alone. That's significant. That's a significant amount of population. Now, if you look at it this way, about 2,000, 3,000 people are actually men that get it because men do get breast cancer. Now, why is breast cancer on the rise for men? We're going to get to that, okay? And it's not because, once again, you're going to see some of these risk factors and it kind of doesn't make a lot of sense, but you're going to find out that men and women actually get, get breast cancer for some of the very similar same reasons and what if they're preventable, okay? Now, breast cancer incident rates in the United States um, began decreasing, okay, in the year 2000, <laughs> now roughly. Now it's interesting, so we've got all these forms of treatments and what they found out statistically, the reason why they dropped really between the year um, 2002, 2003 is because they found out that a major contributing um, aspect of why women are getting breast cancer postmenopausal was actually hormone therapy. Let me say it again. The Women's Health Initiative came out and they found out that, guess what? What they were doing as far as care for women was leading to high incidences of breast cancer and making them increase. But then for a very short time, once again, between the years of 2002 and 2003, they dropped about 7%. Now, statistically now, especially over the last 10 years, they've increased, um, actually, pretty dramatically, okay? Now, I say, well, doc, but wait, they talk about breast cancer and survival rates. Well, they talk about survival rates. They don't talk about incidences anymore because incidences are actually continuing to go up, and the amount of one out of eight, probably in the next 20 years, if we continue on the same approach and the same thinking, it may be one out of four, all right? So now, so that was interesting. So I want you to remember that, that just by changing the current method and standard of care for women under the doctor's care of our current medical system, which is still a very high prevalence of, of uh, care today, was leading to one of the reasons why women were developing a significant amount of breast cancer. See, I wanna kinda go back to that. And, and um, 
I want you to think about, now put yourself in my shoes. Put yourself from, coming from a different perspective that so many people are getting these conditions. And then you find out that the current standard that they did for postmenopause women was one of the big contributors to why actually women were getting breast cancer in the first place. And actually well documented about it. Think about that. That's why people say to me, my doctor said, I see a real doctor. Well, guess what? Documented wise, real doctors actually created a ton of breast cancer. Documented wise, your professional that your doctor said actually led you to it. It still happens today. So once again, as I will always put myself in your shoes, put yourself in my shoes. Put yourself in the fact that people actually end up on dead ends, and that's when I finally get to see them. That's when Wells Way Clinic finally gets to see them, because why? They've exhausted all their, my doctor said, and that's when they end up in places like us. So just come from the standpoint that just a reduction was decreased by 7% by standard care of medicine today. Okay, now, other instances that kind of go through, for women in the U.S., breast cancer death rates are higher than those of ever other cancer besides lung cancers, okay? So death rates are significant. Now, they talk about survival rates, but death rates are very different, all right? Because survival rates are only based on really five years, okay? Now, what else? Besides skin cancer, breast cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer, all right? Now, it's really sad. Uh, the, think about this. In 2019, it's estimated about 30% of new diagnosed cancer, cancers of women will be breast cancer. So overall, it's by far one of the biggest cancers that they have, obviously with the exception of skin cancer. And could there be a relationship? Well, there is. Well, so we see the instances of cancer. They're significant. They continue to grow. Here's some other stats that come up. Now, I'm not going to read all of them to you, but I do want to just point out some things that are pretty interesting, okay? When you look at, once again, there's currently right now to 2019, 3 million women roughly deal with cancer as we talk now. Not new instances, not deaths, 3 million women right now. Now, watch this, because we're going to get into this in detail so you guys get a great concept of this. About 5 to 10% of breast cancers can be linked to gene mutations inherited by one's mother or father. Uh, the mutations of BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes are the most common, all right? Now, so what they're saying is roughly 5 to 10% of the population. Uh, I don't know where they get that statistic. I'm going to show you a graph that they post out there um, and why they say as high as 10% because what they'll do is this. They'll say, look at 10% of women, uh, 1 out of 10. All right, but still one out of eight women totally get breast cancer. But here's one thing that's statistically kind of interesting. About 85% of breast cancers occur in women who have no family history of breast cancer. Okay, now it's interesting because you've been perpetuated to think consistently that what? That family history is one of the biggest contributors to breast cancer. And statistically that makes no sense. Well, my doctor said, I don't care what your doctor said. Statistically, that makes no sense, especially because if you look at, for example, just the BRCA genes alone, which we're going to look at some of the major treatments that they have for this, um, can maximize. I'm going to show you the, why they have the stat of 10%, but it's actually misleading. It's not even close to 10%. It's much lower, all right? But they use a misleading statistic. But even then, let's say it is 5%. Let's say it is 2%, which is more of the true stats. That way, let's say 5%. That still means 95% of these conditions are not based on the BRCA1 and 2 gene, where people have mentally been convinced that this is the major factor contributing to their reason why they have cancer. But you know, let me tell you something. Let me give you my personal opinion. I'm reading stats that you can read. They're pretty simple, but I'm gonna give you my personal opinion. I actually personally believe I know why medicine actually says genetics. It's very simple, because then you're a victim and you have no control over your destiny of health or anything else. That actually puts someone else in control that can try to manipulate your situation. And since you're not a real doctor, you have no uh, control of the course of your life. See, it's the greatest uh, game ever played. Because when you can blame things on genes, then guess what happens? You have no control over it. But I'm gonna even show you how, if you even have these genes, once again, it doesn't statistically mean that you will even have cancer, all right? Now, so once again, 85%, but here, fancy Nancy, 
media team's here. Good morning, all you guys that are here this morning. But Fancy Nancy is the only woman here today. The greatest risk factor in everything that you actually see when it comes to breast cancer that they list out there today is number one, the most significant risk factor is gender, being a woman. Okay, <laughs> well, that encompasses a lot of people, okay? And once again, being a woman and age, so growing older. So if you're a woman and age, it's your biggest risk factor. I just like saying, if you're born, you have risk factor of being, you know, um, uh, getting breast cancer. That's like saying, which once again, if you drive a car, you have risk factor of getting accidents. Yes, that's generally true. Um, and there's people that have had accidents and had passed away from it that way. But that's a very general risk factor. We got to get a little more detail than that. All right. Now they list other ones, but it's kind of funny. It's one of the biggest ones. So what? So let's stay with breastcancer.org and actually find out what they say. The reason why I'm actually doing this, because you can follow me around. You can go to breastcancer.org and we're going to Mayo Clinic like I usually always do just to, to give some reference. That way you can jump on the internet right now and follow me along with this. Um, but I want you to see what they're leading people and giving them their perspective. And this is the perspective that all medical doctors and all oncologists and everything are taught to actually think. And that's why people always say, my doctor said. All right. See, I want people to, when I do a different perspective, the reason why I'm getting the mass amount of emails and, and social media posts and actually shares and, and actually publicity from it is because, once again, I share an idea, a perspective, and I have yet to people say, it, that doesn't make sense. Actually, it's the totally opposite. The overwhelming thing is you make so much sense. It's just the emotional aspect of what you've been trained to think your whole life. I'm coming around and doing what? Challenging that thinking. So let's see what they're saying here at breastcancer.org, what breast cancer is. Breast cancer is a uncontrolled growth of breast cells. Um, guess what? Um, you know, I can, I can agree with that. Once again, these cells, for example, are growing at a faster rate than the average normal healthy cell, all right? To better understand breast cancer, it helps understand how any cancer can develop. Cancer occurs as a result of mutations or abnormal changes in the genes responsible for regulating the growth cells and keeping them healthy. The genes are in each cell nucleus, which acts as control room of each cell. Normally, the cells in the bodies replace themselves through an orderly process of cell growth. Healthy cells take over and old ones die out. But over time, mutations can turn on certain genes and turn off certain genes. Hold the phone. So get this. I actually totally agree with that. And Fancy Nancy gave me the deer in the headlight look. You say, doc, doc. No, you say the genes is it. Oh, no, no, this is the, follow me in this. I actually don't mind that explanation. I'm going to explain why. You say, well, doc, well, you know, because here's what happens. It didn't just say that you had this gene. It also said the gene can actually be, you know, affected. It can be turned on, turned off. Okay, I agree with that. And any geneticist agrees with that. And any geneticist is gonna look at a gene and say there's factors that affect the gene that can now turn it on and turn it off and the cell responds to its genetic stimulus. Hmm, so far I love this, all right? They change cells, gain the ability to divide without control or order, producing more cells, just like in forming a tumor. All right, I actually went from given statistics and given generalities that way to actually not a bad definition. Now, um, over time, cancer cells can invade nearby healthy tissues. That's when it metastasizes and become very detrimental because it can go to the organs, all right? And see what they do, they forget to tell you this. What they tell you is when you look at, you say, doc, but the, but the survival rates have increased. That's not really true. Look at the five-year studies of actually um, cancer treatments and they say, listen, and statistically, they show the survival rate has increased. What they forget to tell you is the fact that if it has metastasized to other parts of the body, the death rate is significant. It goes from, they say, well, if you catch breast cancer at an early stage where it hasn't spread, uh, survival rates are like 80, I've read them far from 80 to 91%. But if you miss that stage, your survival rate drops below 20%. And then statistically, after five years, it dramatically goes down your survival rate. So that's why they only do it to five years. All right. And that's why a standard care for medications post breast cancer 
are actually really based on five years. And if you're a five-year survivor, if you die at year six, statistically, you're still, a five, you're still a cancer survivor. That's how they manipulate statistics and then actually show it on TV saying, our survival rates, whoa, whoa, what survival rate? Because maybe uh, breast cancer stage one, your survival rate is that way for five years, but you get to breast cancer three, it's not those survival rates. That's why I tell people, don't mislead people. Just tell the truth and let people make the decisions for themselves, all right? So now, uh, breast tissue, underarm, lymph nodes, yeah, it does. In, in cancer cells, get into lymph nodes, it can go our pathways. Now, here we go. Breast cancer is always caused by a genetic abnormality, a mistake in genetic material. <laughs> oh, please. I'm trying to uh, stay calm uh, and, and, and not get emotional because you know why? Everything in medicine is the body makes a mistake. It's the major premise why I won't play their game. It's a major premise why there, I train doctors all over the world. It's a major premise why I, uh, I'm starting my practitioner program because that is the major thinking that separates where I've come up with all the principles to where medicine does it. Because I'm going to show you, once again, where the body doesn't make mistake. It actually adapts to its survival. Like it adapts to its surroundings and it tries to survive. So I want to show you something here. So now, here we go. However, only, now wait, wait, now here, here we go. Now uh, watch the two sentences here. That's what I want to show you. Breast cancer is always caused by a genetic abnormality, a mistake in genetic material. However, only five to 10 of the cancers are due to abnormal inherited from your father and mother. Instead, 85 to 90% of breast cancers are due to genetic abnormalities that happen as a result of aging process, the wear and tear of life. Okay, well, is it mom's fault or is it wear and tear of life? All right, see once again, but how many times is the number one spoken thing to breast cancer a family history? Well, mom had it and you had it, okay, and grandma had it, so you better get your boobs cut off right away. Do you understand? And I know it sounds funny, but it's not that funny anymore because you would be surprised the amount of things like that happen, all right? So now, once again, you can read all the rest of this. Um, but here's one thing. I do want to say this, okay? I want to say something that emotionally is going to sound very insensitive, but at least I'm going to say it to actually get people to think differently. Developing breast cancer is not your or anyone's fault. Feeling guilty or telling yourself that breast cancer happened because of something you or anyone else did is not productive. Really? What if you had an effect on your genes? What if you had an effect on the development of it? Whose fault is it? You're already blaming your mom and dad, your mom and your grandma for the family history and the bad gene. But when it's again, that's not the major aspect where it comes from. See, people sometimes are very offended when I talk about responsibility, responsibility, because once again, we've actually been programmed by doctors that it's not our fault. Because why? Because a lot of these things are genetic. But once again, it makes no sense. And if they're right, why are the statistics in every condition, forget about breast cancer, every condition going in the wrong direction? Maybe it's time to take responsibility. Maybe it's time to actually have a different perspective on this. Maybe you do have to feel bad. Maybe you do have to cry. Maybe you do have to realize that, once again, stop blaming your mom, your grandma, and maybe it was you, okay? And I know it's not gonna win many fans, but I'm not here to win fans. I'm here to give you a perspective that hopefully can impact your life and change it in a wholly different direction, all right? So now, breast cancer, I love it, I had to highlight it, is always caused by a genetic abnormality, a mistake. It's the only part of the part that I will hugely disagree with. Now, so I did, so I pulled this out. From the statistics of why they use five to 10%, because they looked at populations that had the BRCA gene, number one and two. Now, I could do just a different perspective on the BRCA gene alone. But to remember this, go back to the definition that happens. Once again, as the, you have the gene, that's not just because you have the gene, you will end up with breast cancer. And what they did, statistically, they said, okay, people that have the gene, once again, the rates of people that get cancer in the African American is one to 3%. Okay, and here's what happens. In a certain Jewish community, what they found out was eight to 10% in one BRCA gene, but then two, it's only 1%. So what they did is if you average these all together, it may be, it may be it's 5%, but then they take the highest number and say, well, look at five to 10%. If you remove this alone, you're at maybe 1.2% of the people that 
have the BRCA genes and things like that actually get cancer. Really different statistic when you actually look at true statistics. So that's why when people say things, always say this, Doc, where did you read that and can I have a copy of it? Don't just give me a conclusion or a paperwork that actually says, here's the amount of people, five to 10% of people. The way they got 10% is based on one number, on one culture community. Yet me, once again, as a white, uh, for a woman, I was saying, not me, so let's say my wife, um, her rate is maybe 2% if she has the gene. Well, that's a significant difference between five to 10%. That's dramatic. See, so that's how they mislead people when they say five to 10% on what does that, because if they take the eight, 10% and average it out, well, then it's really between five and 10, they take the highest number. Misleading, don't do that to people, don't. You know what I'm saying? Give people generally are smart. If you give them things and actually walk them through stuff, instead of using fear and emotion, because that's one thing I will not do. I will not perpetuate fear and emotion to actually get somebody to follow what I have to say. I'm going to lay out an idea, and if it makes sense, great. If it doesn't, that's okay, okay? But the only reason it doesn't make sense is because what they'll do is they'll fight me emotionally because it changes what their grandma and their mom and dad and everybody else has taught them even publicly their whole life. But like you said, put yourself in my shoes as I put myself in yours every time I do a video. If you sit there and see the amount of suffering, if you sit there and see the amount of statistics that are going the wrong direction, you have to take, sit back and take notice of that. And you gotta go, we're not going the right direction. We're going off a cliff. And just by pumping the brakes and actually coming up ways to slow the brakes down does not put us away from the direction you go off the cliff. We need to change, change direction. Now, so let's go actually then to Mayo Clinic. Because maybe Mayo Clinic has a little bit better explanation, you know, because once again, they are the number one diagnostic place in the world. And that's the key. You guys have heard this, especially if you're my age. How many guy, times have you heard this? And statistically, I know why they say this. Early detection is prevention. Okay. Now, that actually was taken from uh, actually a different statement. It was actually said that early detection reduces and prevents death at a, <laughs> at a earlier age, which means this, if you find it early enough, well then our five year statistics can actually be better. But early detection does not mean prevention. It meant prevention of death at a younger age, okay? So, but you see how I say early detection means prevention. And it's repeated. See, if you say something loud enough and long enough, people will believe it. Early detection is prevention. Early detection is prevention. I want you to think about this. I literally hear women say this constantly. I go in for early detection. Wait, do you understand? That means you got it. That means if they find it. There's consistent websites that say, at least by if you get your mammogram and it's clear, you don't have to worry till next year. That's what it says. I'm like going, so wait, didn't develop it. Let's just wait till next year. Did develop it, wait till next year. Oh, we got it. But at least we got it early. At least we got it early. Because we have a chance of preventing your death compared to finding it later. That's where that all came from. But you see how they shortened up? Early detection is prevention. That makes no sense, all right? Now, so let's see what Mayo Clinic says about breast cancer. Breast cancer is a cancer that forms in the cells of the breast. Great. After skin cancer, breast cancer is most commonly diagnosed in the United States. Breast cancer can occur in both men and women. Great. Once again, now here, watch this, and this is where the difference comes in thinking. Substantial support, substantial, over a trillion dollars. Let me say it again, over a trillion dollars. Do you want me to say it again? Trillions of dollars. For breast cancer awareness and research funding has helped create advances in diagnosis and treatment of breast cancer. Okay, diagnosis, which means you're already sick. Treatment, once again, trying to get it early enough to fall in those five-year statistics. Ladies, once again, who here wants to be one out of eight? So advancing money to actually, once again, I have no problem with it. I honestly don't have any problem with it. But if this is our basis for breast cancer, is wait until you have it and see what you can do to deal with it, is, a, is actually ludicrous. It's actually the wrong thinking that we're perpetuating to women. Wrong, by far. It's, it's, it's actually misleading women. Because it's like this. There's arguments in the medical field of when the first mammogram should be. 
okay? Now, if it was a safe technology, there would be no debate. Do you know why? Because it wouldn't have any harm, okay? But think about this. When you look at the statistics, they say, well, we need, instead, of, instead of 50 years old, we need to do 40. And I have a different perspective. If you're finally thinking about your breast health at 40 years old, because unlike skin cancer, unlike lung cancer, which happens more in the fifth decade of life, statistically cancer actually is creeping down lower and lower, and now women in their 20s and 30s are getting on a regular basis. Statistically, in 2019, 2018, is the highest rate of women above, um, below 40 years old getting it ever in history. Why? Why is this disease, this condition, creeping its way back to younger and younger? Is it genes? We've been around for at least 5,000 years. Why is it in the last really decades that it used to be called a disease that grandma and grandpa, or not grandpa, grandma and everybody got, I'm just talking chronic illness, it's creeping its way back, it's because it's right here. It's how we look at it. So our, the, the, the argument that, sh that we should argue about mammograms at 50 or 40 is ludicrous. Why don't we actually start taking care of our breasts the minute women get them? Do you understand? It's, it's a totally different thought process. Now, so once again, you know, when we look at the, the, the overall symptoms, you know, it's really funny. The reason why I pulled this up, which means really nothing to you guys that much, but it just talks about the thickening of the breasts, the change of the breasts, the inverted nipples, the change uh, skin-wise, stuff of like this. Do you, know, do you know every breast cancer website? Can anybody tell me the number one emotional feeling you can feel if you have breast cancer? Everybody in the media team is going, I've never heard you say this. There is none. There is none. So that's why I kind of find it interesting that women that are 20 and 30 and 40 years old tell me that they feel amazing. And I'm like, don't care how you feel. Neither do your breasts. See, we judge our health so much by how we feel. But really what happens is there is no symptom. And people say, doc, the pain in the breast. No, 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 no. Pain comes when there's significant growth, which now leads to pressure and, and, and changes of vascular and neuro, neurological things. So therefore, that is also late stage. That's not initial stage. You have, there is no symptomatology for breast cancer. Their signs are significant during breast exams, that's why they talk about so much, but then even to know it in a, in a sign as far as like an exam, you've already developed it, okay? Now, causes, okay, so here we go. Let's look at this. Causes, doctors know that breast cancer occurs when some breast cells begin to grow abnormally. All right, let's go here. Why is it that a woman can have a breast tumor, breast cancer right here, but not on the opposite breast? Are they genetically different? Are they? They're not. But why is it that maybe they can have it here instead of not here, or here instead of here? You know what I'm saying? See, it's the, remember I taught you guys before, the questions that you ask will always determine the quality of your life in anything, especially health. See, what they do is, the, but people say, well, Doc, I, got, I found a right lump on my breast, and they said it's cancerous. Okay, why not left? Is it right breast cancer lump? Why not left cancer breast cancer lump? I mean, the tissues, you say, you gotta start thinking about this stuff, okay? So now, the cells divide more rapidly than healthy cells, which I too agree, and continue to accumulate, forming a lump or mass. Cells may spread, metastasize, that's when the stages go up, through your breast and lymph nodes or any parts of the body. Great. Breast cancer more often begins with cells of milk producing ducts. Milk producing ducts. There is a reason why. There's a significant reason why I'm gonna show you this happens, okay? Breast cancer may also begin in the glandular tissue, the lobules, okay, or other parts. So it can, it can go anywhere there's breast tissue. But once again, that breast tissue can now metastasize and travel to other parts of the body and grow there. And that's when the survival rates drop dramatically. See, so when you talk about, well, doc, they said survival rates are great. Yes, very early stage cancer rates, that they can go in there and do some form of medical treatment that way, and then your survival rate's there. It doesn't talk about reoccurrences, though because the reoccurrences are more common than people are told, okay? Because they base those reoccurrences after five years. And if you don't reoccur within five years because of their treatment, they consider you a cancer survivor even if you reoccur at six years or five years in six months, okay? Now, researchers have identified hormonal, lifestyle, and environmental factors that may increase your risk of breast cancer. All right, so if you think about this, right? Hormonal, lifestyle, environmental factors that may increase risk of breast cancer. Well, hormonal, 
talked about just even going back to the statistics of when they saw a drop in breast cancer, that there was a hormonal component to it. Lifestyle factors, environmental factors. I'm always curious, and actually I did a little bit more research on this when it came to Stanford, because Stanford talks a lot about the BRCA genes and stuff like that. And they talk about the genes can be affected by environmental factors. I'm gonna show you some of those environmental factors that can change the gene, all right? So now, but it's not clear why some people have no risk factors to develop cancer, yet other risk factors never do. Now, risk factors. Number one, what is it, Nancy? Female, <laughs> being female. If you have breasts, you automatically are actually uh, a risk factor for breast cancer. Well, once again, males get breast cancer too, just at a lot less rate. Why? Why is it that men have tissue and women have breast tissue yet the rates are dramatically different. Now, and on top of it, the rate of male breast cancer has increased dramatically, especially over the last 20 years. And there is a connecting factor between men and women and why the rates are continuing to go up. And Duran, hang in there with me. I just gotta set you up for this. Age, okay, once again, Personal history of breast conditions. You're right, if you have abnormal breast hyperplasia, cysts, fibroids, things like that, it's going to possibly happen, all right? Uh, personal history of breast cancer, family history, inherent genes that increase cancer risk, radiation exposure, hold the phone, hold the phone. Radiation exposure. Can somebody tell me the major diagnostic tool for finding breast cancer, its initial stages? Mammograms, what is mammograms? High exposure, high exposure. So isn't it funny? The tool that they actually try to convince women that will actually um, find a dense mass, which it misses significantly, significantly, is actually a factor that can increase your risk of it that way. Actually, they've actually shown statistically that they will actually, consistent mammograms will actually contribute to it. That's kind of interesting. Don't you think there should be a different way? There is. Okay, uh, obesity. Beginning your period at a younger age. All right, what else? Being menopausal, okay? Having your first child at an older age. Having never been pregnant. So it went from having kids to never having kids. You're saying? Postmenopausal hormonal therapy. Ooh, once again, there they go even today. Postmenopausal hormone therapy. If you understand why I am so against. Premarin and the other factors and the other, other synthetic estrogens used is because they are a very large contributor to cancers itself. And that stems to what I'm going to lead into now. If you look at this, breast cancer risks for women and what can be done for people that are high risk, which means, for example, if you have any of those risk factors, they're going to move you into a risk factor category. And here, after everything they talk about, genes, hormones, lifestyles, here is the one of the major treatments that they can do when it comes to it. Number one, preventative medications. Somebody tell me what a preventive medication is. Please do. Please tell me what a preventive medication is. I still don't know what that means, okay? It's really good to mislead the public, but it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense, all right? Now, once again, what are they? Estrogen blockers, okay? Now think about this. So they're blocking the hormone estrogen, but what's the other preventative thing? Preventative surgery. So we're just gonna remove all of your breast tissue. And therefore, your chance of breast cancer is not there. Well, I got a question for you. And I got a question for you guys, because most of you guys didn't watch this because you didn't really think breast cancer applied to you. It does. Your rates are going up at a significant rate. Let me see a question. I wonder who's gonna be the first male that has preventative breast surgery. I know, all me teams like going, never thought about that. That's the point. Most people don't think anymore. Most people are not thinking through this. They just say, uh, yes, you're an educated person. Be very careful of educated people. Really, I mean that sincerely. And what I mean by that is this, sometimes educated people, including our current healthcare system, cannot think by but what somebody told them. And when you find out who told them, you'd actually be kind of disgusted because there's always some financial factor that leads them to do what they're doing. Now think about that. Preventative medications, preventative surgeries. With the, you're gonna see now, over the next year, you see it already, the biggest debate right now is still healthcare. Healthcare is a right. Healthcare is this. And therefore, guess what? 
do you really think I want to actually contribute my dollars to give that to people? No, if you want to do it with your money, go for it. But to come up with this reason for, you know, the best prevention for breast cancer, especially if you have any kind of gene formation that way, is pre preventive surgery or medications? So I got a question for you. <laughs> Are you as confused as I still am? See, that's the thing. See, it's really funny. If you think about it this way, there's an old saying that educated people take things that are very complex and make it are simple and make it complex so they sound smart. A teacher takes something very complex and makes it simple. That's what these things are for. So I tell people this, are you still worried? So after reading all of that and everything out there, you can go to every website, I guarantee you're still just as worried and just as fearful and just as confused as you were before. It's why people do what the doctor says, because they're confused. So let's start here. Now, I want you to put yourself in my shoes. As I said, I put myself in your shoes before. So a bunch of us docs just started our 20th year in practice, 20, well, actually 21st year in practice. I want you to think about this. The majority of people that have ever initially started here or have ever come here actually have already been through all of that stuff, okay? With the exception, a lot of times, I've never met a woman yet, personally, that has actually had a preventative surgery. You hear about them all the time, including Angela Jolie, all right? So the thing is this. What I want you to think about is this. So as people come in, you get the stories of they've been through the current care, the current things, chemotherapy and radiation and things like that. And they put them on a standard form of medication, post that for at least five years. Now they're telling people, once again, you may be on this medication for the rest of your life. And here is their driving factor. If you do not, your reoccurrence becomes this. Well, then that should actually do this. That should actually lead to you to understand and think that, well, even if you did a therapy like chemotherapy and radiation and destroyed those cells, if they're redeveloping, the causal factors are still there, are still there. So docs, oncologists, OBs, endocrinologists, all, all you docs, what have you done for prevention? If you think early detection is prevention, or if you think you know, medication or surgeries are prevention, you're misleading everybody. And this needs to stop. It needs to stop. Because you know why? You know what I'm fed up with? You know what all the doctors across the country are fed up from one's way? Is seeing women and husbands and couples come in on a regular basis emotionally destroyed because they've been through everything they got cancers, and all of a sudden, not only have they got them, they went through massive months of treatment with no success, with no success. And then they go for alternative methods. And I'm gonna tell you right now, I don't care if you go into different alternative methods, if the thinking doesn't change, you can go get IVs of vitamin C and all the things, which actually I know all about. I've actually even write IV bags for people, okay? But if all you do is kill off cancer naturally, all you have to do is give it some time. And that train is gonna come all around all over again. So alternative therapy, I'm not against. It's gonna sound funny. I'm not even against medical therapy. I'm not. If you're gonna die, do something. That's why we created the analogy. Fire department, house on fire, put it out. But you still have a burnt up house. And if you have put out the fire naturally or medically, you still have a bad house. It's time to rebuild. It's time to change the thinking. So here's what happened to me. What changed my thinking the most? Actually, when I first started practice. See, that's the point. I want to tell you that. I do have an extensive education. I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud that I went and I learned absolutely nothing. I know it sounds funny, but I'm just saying the fact that did I learn some anatomy? Did I learn some physiology? Did I, yes, I did. But here's what happens. They never taught me a how to apply it. I basically got a medical education, and the medical education that I got was to refer out to the smart real doctors. You think I'm joking? You ask all these kids that just got done with their boards. I know I call them kids, but they're all adults. Just got done with their boards. The majority of the questions are refer out. Refer out to what? The current thinking is actually not going in the right direction. So all of a sudden, I'm young in practice, a 56-year-old menopausal woman comes in with cancer, with breast cancer. And she was actually extremely devastated. She was actually just, uh, um, her prognosis wasn't good. 
she actually been through both chemotherapy and radiation. And what happened is she was taking this lovely hormone before this called Premarin. All right. Now, it was interesting because I said to her, I'm like, now remember, I'm not joking. This was earlier before they did the whole women's health initiative and everything like that. And I'm like going, so she's on the medication. And I'm like, hold it. Because the thought process I already had developed with Christy. And I say, what? What does Christy have to do with breast cancer? See, there's the thing. See, as you guys know, endometriosis and all the things she went through that way, there was a hormone component to it that way. And because we started to figure those things out, all these things started to change. So I already had a concept hormonally in some of the things that are going on. I'm like, hold the phone. You're on hormone replacement therapy, HRT. Well, she goes, oh, doc, but my goodness, before I took HRT, man. And I said, when did you start taking it? She goes, I started to take it in my later 40s. I said, okay. I said, why in your later 40s? She goes, because I started to go through perimetopause, which watch my past videos, there's no such thing. Perimetopause, and I was going through all these symptoms, and then they gave me Premarin, and I felt so much better. And I said to her, I said, do you understand that, for example, one of the major negative side effects of Premarin is actually breast cancer? Now, no joke. She had no clue. Here was the worst part. She called her doctor up, and you know he told her? There's no relationship between those two. Well, I wish, once again, that this would have been brought out way before, because it was interesting, because the minute that they actually, she had breast cancer, she went through chemotherapy ration, still on hormones, but it was interesting. You're gonna find this not even real. See, the stories I tell sometimes, thank God I keep all the evidence of my files and things like that, especially when I got to do these things because you would not believe this. So all of a sudden, I was like, okay, now you went through, and, and what are medications you're taking? We're going to come back to this little thing down here, but not yet. She was also taking tamoxifen. Tamoxifen is by far, the, once again, and you can look this up, is by far the oldest and most prescribed selective estrogen receptor module medication. Okay, Doc, what the, what the heck does that mean? Well, it's quite simple, okay? When you look at what it does, let's take a look. Every cell in the body has receptors. So this is a cell, okay? Just a normal, healthy cell. It has receptors. It's like, it's like this. It's like a boat going into a port. Well, here's what happens. Tamoxifen actually attaches onto the receptor so the estrogen cannot attach the receptor to tell the gene what to do. And therefore the increase in replication of the cell does not happen. So I'm not joking. She's taking hormone replacement therapy with dominant estrogen hormone in it. And then she was actually taking tamoxifen. And I was like, really? Really? And then the doctor said that it had no relationship to it. And she believed him. She believed him. Now remember, not a joke. At this time, I'm like maybe 26, 27 years old. And I'm like, your doctor is extremely wrong on this. On top of it, on top of it, it's actually one of the major causal factors of what's going on with you. It's why, once again, now if you understand why her prognosis wasn't good, because she was actually taking hormone, accelerating the problem, and then she was trying to inhibit it, but the effect was still happening. So she said, she goes, she was confused. She sat there mostly going, this, this oncologist tell me this, and then this weird 27-year-old, 26-year-old young man tell me this. Who's right? And I'm like, well, let's walk through this. So get this. So here's what I did with her. I said, do me a favor. I said, go talk to your doctor and ask him why he's giving you hormone, tell you something not to get the hormone. Now, here was his, here was his analogy. Well, we have to lower some estrogens and things like that, but we have to make sure that we don't lower them too much because it's going to cause all these other health problems. Now, believe it or not, rationally, that sounds right because if you get too low hormones, because you look at the side effects of tamoxifen or any hormonal changing medication, there's a lot of host of problems. But I always said this, I'm like, that makes no clinical sense because once again, at, you are having a rapid growth of cells which are contributing from your estrogens that way. Can you do me a favor? Can you at least tell him 
to pull off your hormone replacement therapy. Now, no joke, within a very short time, we're talking within six months, her prognosis got better. She still took her tamoxifen, it's not a joke. She still took her tamoxifen, and I spent my time doing what we are great at. And that's what I'm gonna explain. And I started to go, here we go. I understand what they're doing medically and why they do it, but it's also moving people in the very wrong direction. Because besides tamoxifen, today, which is extremely common, is aromatase inhibiting medications. And you say, well, doc, what did they do? Well, what they do now that when you get breast cancer, they'll put you on a form of tamoxifen, they'll put you on a, 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 a form of femura, and what they do by nature, it inhibits the production of estrogen in women. Now, that means that this will actually buy, stop it from binding on a cell. This will stop it from converting. Now, what do I mean? These medications inhibit the aromatase enzyme to convert to estrogens. And this is the standard form of treatment for the majority of breast cancer out there. Now, I don't have the time today, but I'll do it in another video, to go over actually other forms of breast cancer, mainly estrogen and progesterone negative cancers. That is strictly an immune issue. But the majority of cancers are not that way. The majority of breast cancers, for example, that's why if you look, the majority of the treatment they have for them is usually some tamoxifen estrogen blocker and usually some aromatase inhibitor. So what happened was, that's when all of a sudden, guess what happens? I'm like, well, they're gonna give Fremura, which is a very common aromatase inhibitor drug today, and now they see a reduction of reoccurrence from these medications in five years. That's why the standard was five years. That's why the standard of care was to give these medications for five years. But what happened was this. After five years, they caused so many health problems, they got people off of it, and that's why reoccurrences started to go up post five years. Deaths started to go up post five years. And it's why they actually, when you look at the statistics, they don't look for a 20 year period. When they get on, when they get on TV and say, the um, deaths from cancers have gone down significantly. That's not true. The death in five years has reduced if it's caught on an earlier stage. The death post five years is significant. Significant. Because their form of treatment is only short term because it causes a whole host of other health problems that they actually ethically have to stop. And now today, once again, it's why a lot of doctors today are very careful but still do it in giving hormone replacement therapy because it led women to so many health problems today. So once again, I'm like, that's when I started to really have my, my, my light bulb moment when it came to breast cancer, the majority of them. I was sitting there going, you know something? We're approaching this the wrong way. We're approaching this totally wrong way. Their perspective in dealing with these effects is only leading to more health problems and is only leading to manipulation of statistics to show that there's a better way. And there's not. That's not at all. That's why when people say, Doc, we got all the cancer. I don't care. Because that train is gonna come around very soon once your treatments stop. And that's the part that's missing today. Heck, if you ever think of it this way, medications give you some time to actually change your habits. If you do not, those lifestyle things that you're responsible for can make a great effect on what's going on. Now, so you say, Doc, well then what's the approach? Well, it's simple. Estrogens are not the problem. And I say, hold up. Even <laughs> Brandon looked up and he's like, Brandon looked up and said, you just kind of talked about the whole process of estrogens and things like that. Yes, because you know why? Today they demonize estrogens. You say, Doc, you just gave me the first Oh my goodness, hour. Took a long time to set it up. The first hour was all about the hormones and estrogens and things like that. Whoa, 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 whoa. I was just giving you the example of what was going on. But here's what happens. Estrogens are not the problem. They're not. And as you guys patiently wait and the media team's going, come on, come on, I, I gotta know what, what you're gonna say next. It's really simple. 
abnormal levels of estrogens are the problem. Guess what? That's why they demonize estrogens. If, if estrogen gets too high, hold the phone. Once again, if certain estrogens get too high, there's certain estrogens that are protective. I know this sounds so simple, but what made my message resonate all over the world is when I actually asked women, is estrogen a hormone? And I know, now, now follow me this, if you haven't ever watched me before, I kind of set people up to challenge their thinking. And if you've ever been to my hormone connection seminar, which I will tell you, I'm coming out of retirement for a couple. I am, so watch for that. I'm, I'm not doing a lot. I'm just coming out to retirement for a couple. But at my hormone connection seminar, at the I disagree seminar, I have people do this. I'll say, raise your hand if you've heard the hormone estrogen. And every woman, every woman, unless they followed our stuff, raise their, and Brandon and Nancy been there, they sit there and they all raise their hand. And I'll say, that's why you guys are so sick. Because there's no such thing as a hormone called estrogen. And if you're watching me right now and you've never heard me say that because you're new to this process, guess what happens? Estrogen is not a hormone. Estrogen is a term that encompasses a significant amount of hormones. So when women, once again, are the dominant sex characteristic hormone for them that helps them develop their breasts and other parts of their body, their genitals and everything else. Estrogen is key to life to women. But once again, if you think that there's only one of them, you have been dramatically misled and actually have no concept of how your female system works and the effect it has on your body. Because once again, estrogen is not the problem. It's abnormal levels of estrogen that can cause so many genetic factors that your genes respond to its environment. That's why hormones are called messengers. The gene responds to the message. And actually in a, in a term that was co uh, created, it's called an epigenetic process. The hormone actually is a signal to the gene and the genes respond. Is that a mistake? Is that a mistake? And here's what happens. Abnormal levels of certain estrogens can actually cause your DNA to mutate. Ooh, well doc, you know, where's that proven? Let's go through it. So when you look at this, we look at, for example, once again, estrogen metabolism and breast cancer. Now what they found out, and let's go back here, there's a major hormone, now once again, these are a significant amount of the estrogens. There's a whole bunch of them. Do you understand? They're, they're not, there's not one, two, and three, because you've been taught that, guess what, Doc? Well, I did a little research and there's estradiol, estro, and estriol. Good, you got three of them. And even if you measured them, it's still very incomplete. Like I said before, at the hormone seminar, I said, how many guys heard the hormone estrogen? They all raised their hand. I said, that's why you're sick. You're sick because you don't understand there, when you actually measure one or two or three, it's an incomplete picture of how the estrogens are affecting all tissue, including breast tissue. And if all you do is inhibit the production, you may inhibit the one that can actually reduce breast cancer, actually stop the metastasis of breast cancer, stop the production of breast cancer. But then on top of it, you can't do that for a long period of time because every, every part of your body needs estrogen, including your brain. Do you understand there's more receptors for estrogen on the hypothalamus than there is on your breast tissue? Think about that. Your brain needs estrogen more than your breasts do. And that's why if you look, when estrogen gets low, depression, suicide, and all these other things happen. So don't demonize estrogen. But if, the, if there's levels that are abnormal, if there's levels that are abnormal, it's not a mistake. Your body responds to the message, the hormone that's telling it what to do, even the gene. Okay, so now, so we look at this. We look at the, I wanna, I wanna focus today I should just do a whole thing on just every estrogen, but let's focus on today because we're talking about breast cancer for hydroxyesterone and estradiol, okay? It's a metabolite. Hold the phone, what does that mean? Hold the phone, what does that mean? See, you ask your doctor about a hormone metabolite, they're gonna give you a deer in the headlight look because they're, they're clueless about it. See, a hormone is produced by the ovaries, by the adrenal, by the fat tissue. Let me say it again. This frustrates women all to hell, where, and I mean on the infertility realm, because that's how I built 
my actually whole career clinically was based on fertility itself and our success that we had with it. I used to have women sit across from me. This still happens today. Not that I see new patients, just I'll talk to women. They'll say, Doc, I, I work out. You know, look at me, I'm in good shape. And, and I do everything right, and I'm healthy, and all of this, they say they're healthy. And, and I can't, I can't um, 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 have a baby. And then you measure their estrogen levels because they're extremely depleted because thinner women have a hard time producing the amount of estrogen than actually women that have some fat. See, what happens is this. Women, let me tell you something. You're not supposed to have a six pack. If you do, you will deplete your hormone levels because you need some fat tissue. That's why women will always have a difference of it that way, of fat tissue than men. The sad part is this, on the flip side, and this is why the women get frustrated, they say, Doc, this, uh, I'm in fit, I'm in shape, I'm some of that, and I can't have a child. And on the flip side, there's these women that are obese, and they eat Snickers bars, and drink soda, and they pop out kids like Skittles. And I'm like, yeah, because their estrogen levels allow that maturation of the process that you can't do, but hold the phone their rate of breast cancer significantly increases. That's why weight is one of the risk factors. See, that's why you look at, once again, aromatase inhibiting actually affects the fat tissue and conversion of the hormones. It's why, for example, if you, as you get older, you gotta make sure, especially as you're menopausal, you don't wanna put on a lot of weight because your estrogen conversions, especially the one that can increase the risk of breast cancer, dramatically increases. And this is basic biochemistry. This is basic. This is so simple. And the metabolites are the conversions of those hormones from one form to another. Let me say it again. It is the conversion. And here's one thing, ladies. Conversion significantly happens in every cell, but the conversion to its metabolite, the conversion for it to be used, the conversion for it to be eliminated, happens in one major organ. And guess what organ that is? Your liver. Your liver. Ladies, your liver health has an extremely, extremely effect on your breast health. Go back to the Swiss watch principle. That once again, that I'm teaching all the practitioners across the world. Every organ, every system is connected greatly together. If you think that your hormonal system is just dependent on ovary, adrenal, and fat production, that's just the start. There is conversion, there is metabolites that actually can, they get out of control, it's a bad day. So that's why you look at estrogen metabolism, breast cancer, and guess what they found? The 4-hydroxyestradiol and estrone actually do what? Possess carcinogenic potential effects, the ability to cause DNA damage, to cause mutations of the DNA. See, increased levels of this can cause mutations. So do you think, for example, that it's your grandma's fault or your mom's fault that you got breast cancer, or maybe the fact that, once again, the habits that lead to estrogen dominance, which there's a significant amount of habits that your grandma and your mother did, led to the mutations of the gene and led to your risk factors to actually increase. Mutations just don't happen by mistake. They don't. And what if I told you those mutations could be changed? What if I told you? Just like said before, that gene can be turned off can be turned on, can be mutated and repaired. Okay, now, so you look at, talks about how that, how that uh, 4-hydroxyesterone can actually cause mutation changes. So now when the gene responds, it responds not intended the way it was supposed to. It responds exactly what the gene code said. Because why? Because the estrogen levels cause the oxidative damage. So when you look at it this way, estradiol and its metabolites, the four and two, induce mutations in human breast epithelial, and they go through it all. I've said this to you guys in nauseam. You're gonna find out if you watch me for a long period of time, you're gonna say, you notice I don't say many different things. Like I said, I made, I made one of our docs that was here visiting and his staff laugh because I told them I was coming out with a new book five years from now. And I said, and they said, doc, what is it? I said, it's, here's the new title, I still disagree. I still disagree because medical science and medical practice never match up. Now, how is that possible? The problem is not awareness. We see more pink ribbons, we see more fear, we see more things, everything, we see the rate of breast cancer going, I think we have enough awareness. Here's the problem. The problem is no profitable approach. Ooh, no profitable approach. Do you understand 
the debate in healthcare is because if you get cancer and you don't have healthcare, you're going bankrupt. The psychotic cost of healthcare is absolutely ridiculous. Why? You're a business. Business is made off of customers. Customers are made off of sick people. Instead of actually teaching you and understanding the biochemistry, physiology, anatomy, and immunology, everything that you need to do to stay healthy, we created a system, not we. Our profitable system created a system that said, hey, listen, guess what? Lifestyle stuff doesn't make a lot of money. It doesn't. Do you understand that if the, the, the smallest drug company is billions upon billions of dollars? That's why, for example, once again, whenever you see something being pushed legally for healthcare, just understand there's someone behind there paying the bills for that. It's why, it's why people need to stand up and fight. Because once again, there's great approaches to this whole process. Heck, not a joke, even if you wanna look at alternative methods, they're extremely cheap compared to medical methods and have great results. Once again, if you look at the statistics, but the costs are so dramatically different. The profitability of one cancer patient is astronomical. Why do you think hospitals keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and in nicer, nicer, nicer places? Because they're making no profit? It's really sad. So the problem is not awareness. The problem is how we think about this whole approach. And their, pro their approach is basically profit-centered. No, doc, they really care, then why do we spend over a trillion dollars and our statistics continue to get worse? And they have convinced all of you guys it's because of your genes. But the one thing they don't teach you, yet it's all in every scientific literature thing, genes turn on, they turn off, they can be damaged, they can be repaired. But our current system cannot patent those things. So they can't charge a billion dollars for stuff. And that's the sad reality. You say, Doc, that, that's not true. No, then you have your head in the sand. And live and come from our perspective every day when you see this. It's why medicine tries to regulate everything. It's why, for example, I can show you actually even decent medical doctors that left their profession and did natural things and the FDA showed up with guns because they were using vitamins instead of chemotherapy. They pulled their license because they want control, not of the patient, but of the profit. And that's sad. Because I'm gonna show you a breast cancer person. I can show you a ton of them that have been done wonderful when you start to make those changes. So if you look at it this way, doc, say, say, listen, so can that be tested? Yes. See, this is no different than if you have endometriosis, it's no different than if you have any kind of estrogen-based condition that way. But not because you have estrogen, it's because your estrogen levels are actually abnormal. It's why if you look, the majority of breast cancer treatment post-chemotherapy and radiation, which is a whole nother topic, let me give you an example. Do you know what chemotherapy and radiation, radiation really does? Does anybody know what it really does? It does what your immune system was supposed to do. Let me say it again. It does what your immune system was supposed to do. So instead of asking yourself, why did my immune system not destroy those cells? They do what? They create a form of try to destroy cells. But see, at least your immune system can be selective, but chemotherapy can't. That's why it destroys what? Everything. And they're hoping that your body can recover from destroying everything. See, I'd sit there and go, all right, why is my immune system not working good? What can we do? Can it be rebuilt? A carpenter type thinking. So now, so let's take this 70 year old woman that has breast cancer. She came in to see Dr. Greg, okay? And I like to use all my doctors from all over the country's labs, because once again, I got thousands of these, okay? Uh, no, I actually got a lot more than thousands of these. But the idea is this, is currently, and this is actually, once again, a current person, all right? But think of this way. She actually was so surprised that she had cancer. Now look at this, but as you're starting to test those levels, her 4-hydroxyesterone was the only elevated estrogen. But it was interesting. What do you think she did for many years? Hormone replacement therapy. And because of that, what she ended up doing was she felt better. She felt better, she did. She felt great. But then what happened was, her body couldn't metabolize that and it started to increase and it started to cause DNA damage, which now, for example, the gene responded in the form of metastasis of those cells, and that's what they call cancer. This is extremely easily measurable. See, you can just type in, do me a favor, type in 4-hydroxyesterone, 
type in two and 16, type in all of them and see the effects. Now it's really funny. Two methyl hydroxyone, hydroxyesterone and estradiol actually are cancer protective. Let me say it again. They're cancer protective. They protect your breasts and other tissues, ovaries and other things that do a wonderful job of making sure you don't get cancer. So when they actually lower all of the estrogens because there's no therapy that can directly affect just one of those. But watch this, guys. Watch this. Pathways. Huh. The one thing that separated me from everybody across the world, when I started doing this 21 years ago, I started to look at all the pathways and how they're converting, what was going on that way. Let's go back a little bit. Let's go back here. Because I want to show you something. Remember I told you how medical science and medical practice never match up? This is currently on the website of Premarin today, so go to the website. Now they talk about how estrogens and the Women's Health Initiative found out that it can increase breast cancer and ovarian cancer and every other cancer of the body because if you manipulate estrogen levels, you're going to actually have a, a possibility of changing the DNA of all the cells, including ovaries, including bone, including everything. But it's really funny. Watch this. Inducers and or inhibitors of the CYP3A4 may affect estrogen during metabolism. So what you're telling me, an enzyme, a pathway, a hormonal pathway, an enzymatic pathway, a liver pathway, a liver pathway can be disrupted on how these estrogens are metabolized and changed in the body. So what I did as a young 25 year old man, not when it came to breast cancer, but just understanding hormones, all the pathways and how they are affected in the body. And I'm going to show you how a lot of these are affected in the body yet today and what you can do and take responsibility for. And if you don't, it's your fault. See, unlike it says, nobody's fault. Yes, it is. Because there's, you can have an effect on your genes all the time. This idea that your genes are stagnant blueprint make no sense clinically. Make no sense in science whatsoever. None. I'm going to do, actually one of my next videos I'm going to do is just on genes and how they work. So this myth can be put to bed. Because your doctor is going to say it's genetic. What does that mean? My genes can actually change based on my environment. And they can turn on and turn off. Do you know how to do that, doc? Nope. I'm saying them. That's what they'll say. They're going to look at you and say, nope. But there's significant ways that can change those. So let's go on. So now look at this. The purple is where she should be for a menopausal woman. Well, once again, um, her 4-hydroxy is skyrocket and her 16 is low. See what I'm saying? So she actually already has a low estrogen, but she has the one that actually will skyrocket and cause this DNA mutation replication like crazy. All right? So let's look at some of the things that contribute to this. All right? Number one, <laughs> stop listening to doctor's advice. That's the worst thing you can do. They're giving horrible advice out there, leading you with a very wrong perspective. Number two, avoid dairy. Avoid dairy. You say, well, doc, here's what happens. You know, um, they are stopping because they don't realize this, okay? This is kind of common knowledge, guys. The dairy industry injected cows with hormones to make sure you had a good quality product. And every my media team just laughed and looked at me. No, they injected cows with synthetic hormones to make more profit. Sound familiar? To make more profit, to make them produce more milk, bigger, and more, more expensive to sell. But now, even though, for example, that they don't do this as much, it's still performed, is the fact that milk itself is actually a growth hormone for a baby calf. It is. It really is. Now, guess what, Fancy Nancy? We're going to allow some questions after this because I believe we need to talk about this a little longer just with questions. But here's the funny part is this. When dairy is consumed on a regular basis, it's androgenic. It's meant to help things grow. Well, if you have a growth condition, the last thing I do is actually put dairy in there. You say, Doc, what about perfect, raw, organic dairy? It's still a growth product. So I tell people, if you have any form of cancer, please avoid dairy. Number two. Soy products, I don't know why this is controversial. I think it's because when we started practice, the only other options that people had were like rice and soy. 
my goodness, the majority of soy out there is genetically modified, which is actually highly pesticides, which are estrogenic. Soy is actually disgusting for your body. Please don't eat it. Okay, now once again, I know what the questions are gonna come out right now, Nancy. See, I already know your questions. Well, what about miso and tempeh? Just eat something different. Just eat something different. Today, the amount of good, healthy alternatives to what you want to eat with soy is dramatic. Do you saying? When you're talking about things that can go down the wrong direction, I don't care if it's miso and fermented and all the stuff and how good it is that way. I don't care. You're in a state of breast cancer, avoid it. You don't want to have any chance of doing it, okay? Now, flax products. Yes, flax is very estrogenic, all right? So I tell people, if you have breast cancer, avoid those things. Um, heavy metal toxicity and heavy metal poisoning. Do you understand that once again? I know we have offices in Kentucky. I know we have, you know, it's a political issue and stuff of like that. But the amount of environmental exposure to heavy metals is, is dramatic. It really is. That's why if you look on the things about genes and how they're affected, they'll talk about heavy metal ex and, and environmental exposure. Mercury, when you actually b burn a coal plant, there's a lot of it. You know what I'm saying? Energy plants that way do a, a significant amount of heavy metals, lead, cadmium, and stuff. We still have lead in, our, in our, our environment today just from having so much fossil fuels that had lead in it burned for a long time. Heck, kids used to put lead pencils in their mouth. All these things, for example, contribute more to this changes that way. All right, so try to stay away from those heavy metals. Well, Doc, hold the phone. What about vaccines? Yes. The biggest form of heavy metal exposure, also dental fillings. So look at all the factors. That's why women come to say, Doc, it must be my family history because I had breast cancer and my mom did. No, look at all the patterns you followed, especially number six. Birth control itself is an endocrine disruptor. Let me say that again, ladies. And if somebody asks me this question, because Nancy, I know it's going to come, what is a natural form of birth control? There is none. There is none. There isn't. There is no form of natural birth control. All right? And ladies, let's talk about this. Well, Doc, you know, I don't want to get pregnant. Okay? Should I get my tube side? Should I get these things? No. Ladies, don't do anything to your body. It's such a sensitive creature. I don't want you ending up with problems. Well, Doc, my husband just won't use a condom. Watch, ladies, here, look me in the eyes, which reminds me, tomorrow night, Christy and I, back by high demand, because we've been doing stuff we're going to do in the bedroom, and tomorrow night, we're gonna talk about sex. We are, and it's going to be, um, um, it's not going to be PG. All right, because there's some topics that we need to talk about. And so, and it's coming in, and here's what happens. And I'm not a part of this group. My, my team won't let me be a part of this group. We have this Wellness Way women's group. If you're not on there, if you're a woman, go on there. But my wife was dying last night. We were on a date. We were on a date last night after our child's volleyball game. And she's sitting there laughing as I'm driving home. I'm like, what are you laughing at? She's like, you gotta see these questions these women are asking me, which I think is awesome. And so it's kind of cool, but she needed my advice to, to, to actually answer some of the questions. So, but it was kind of funny. So Christy and I will be in the bedroom tomorrow night going over sex, okay? Going over, once again, conversations that you also have with your teenagers, including teenage daughters <clears throat> that I have, okay? And I'll give you a little prelude to it. Don't miss it. You're going to laugh your butt off. But the reason why I'm, we're actually bringing it back is because Christy has had a ton of requests to actually get our opinions back when we're sitting in the bedroom. So we're going to do that. Okay. So back to this. Endocrine disruptors, birth control. Please, there is no good form. There is no good form. And that's why I talked about ladies. You talk about my husband just won't wear condoms and stuff like this. Ladies, guess what? Just say no. Just say no. That guy will do virtually anything you want because eventually he will literally explode if he doesn't. Okay? And everybody started laughing. All the guys in here are laughing. It's like, because they know. Do you understand? Know it's just that emotionally you feel bad, but don't. Okay? It's not worth altering your body. And people say, Doc, what about vasectomy? I'm not for vasectomies, but if you're going to do something to one of the bodies, do it to the males. We can handle it. Our body can take the, a vasectomy that way. Um, I don't have one, never going to do it. I just understand my wife's cycle really well. 
okay? And I'm going to talk about that tomorrow night. Now, avoid tap water. Yes, avoid tap water. Now, is tap water have significant amount of pesticides and other things in it. Birth controls show up in almost all commercial tap water. Because why? Our plants in tap water, once again, people talk about Flint, Michigan and toxicity. Water has been toxic when it's done through the government. Let me say it again. When it's done through the government, it's been toxic and poisoned for a long time. Birth controls are so prevalent in the water, it's absolutely scary. That's why you better have some good filtration system on your house, all right? Now, non-organic skincare lines in cosmetics. This is a whole discussion right there. Be very careful, ladies, of the amount of estrogen products that people put on their skins and their cosmetics. Heck, a lot of lipsticks, commercial lipsticks, actually have estrogen in, in them. It does. And these are endocrine disruptors. That's why it's very good to find a good skincare line that can do a wonderful job. And there's a bunch of them out there, okay? I think we did a, a, just a video on that. Now let me say this. I wanna say this very clearly. I don't talk about products. I don't talk about things online that way. And if we ever promote something, it's because once again, we just like it. You know what I'm saying? We don't have a tie with the company and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? Because then what happens is there's that motive behind it that way. No, our job is to get you the best information possible out there, okay? So now, eat cruciferous vegetables, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank God right now that I'm not a woman because I would probably be the most hormonally disrupted woman on the planet because I hate vegetables. I do. See, if you guys think emotionally that I don't go through what everybody else does, do you know what I'm saying? I, I hate your vegetables, your cruciferous, your broccoli, your cauliflower, your Brussels sprouts, all of them are fantastic. You know, your wheatgrass, your everything, okay? Go more of your cruciferous vegetables because what it does, it has ingredients that help those conversion pathways to move those estrogens in the right direction. It's kind of nice. The sad part is they suck, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You have to be very creative, okay, on how to make them. It's why, once again, it's why I believe supplementation pill form is becoming popular because no one wants to eat vegetables. I know it's like this. It's like this. When I tell people exercise sucks, there's always one person that says, I love exercise. Yes, you're not the norm. There's a lot of people who say, I love my vegetables. Yes, you're not the norm. Okay, that's why I have to cover this in detail that way. Do your cruciferous. Reduce sugar. Hold the phone. The number one reason why men are getting breast cancer today is actually because of sugar. Sugar. Number one, you know why? Because their testosterone converts into estrogens by an aromatase pathway that's increased by sugar. Ladies, that affects you too. It just affects males more because their testosterone converts down to it. You don't have as much testosterone as we do. See, so that's one of the number one reasons why. See, so if you look at the rise of breast cancer in both men and women, actually has everything to do with the abnormal estrogens and how men create those estrogens are actually too much sugar. And with the increase of guys in their weight and man boobs and everything like that, it's going to continue because the consumption of sugar. So who's responsible? Dad's genes of getting breast cancer or is it his habits that he's responsible for? He had breast tissue for a long time. Why is he increasing so much? Because of obesity. Guys, be very careful of your sugar intake. Also, ladies, increase your progesterone. Why is that so significant? Let me show you something really cool, okay? This is that ladies has the high estrogen and the counteracting hormone to all the estrogens to keep them in check is progesterone. Now progesterone, you wanna mainly get done by the blood. Let me say again, you wanna get progesterone done by the blood. It's the most accurate form. You can get some accurate forms in the saliva, but it's mainly done by blood is the best form. It's why, now this is a urine test, that you mainly get the metabolites, aka estrogen metabolites. There's also progesterone metabolites. Once again, I know you never heard of that before because no one's ever taught you hormones properly. So idea is this. But even then, overall, it's low. Now, why is that significant? So she has high estrogens and watch this. This is how genes work. A hormone comes in and attaches to receptor and then it goes to the DNA and estrogen tells it what to do. And it, so it doesn't become damaging to the DNA and doesn't actually cause it to replicate too quickly. Progesterone does what? It binds those receptors and calms the effect down. See, your gene responds 
outside of your cell above epi, your genes. That's why it's called epigenetics. And they change, they turn on, they turn off based upon the environment of cells. I can show you, get this, I can show you research study after research study. One of my favorite people on the planet is named Bruce Lipton. Once again, he's a medical person. He's not a natural guy, but what he did was this. He took cells of, uh, I mean, all stem cells of the same genetic makeup, put them in Petri dishes and changed the environment and the cells changed according to its environment and they're all the same genetics. See, your genes do mutate. They do. But what happens, they mutate based on what's going in and out of them, not based on who passed them to you. See, that's the biggest misconception. They're leading people. So if you look, for example, keep those progesterone levels good, and the number one way to actually keep them good, reduce your chronic mental stress. Because progesterone converts into cortisol and cortisone. So that's why mental stress will definitely increase women's breast cancer chances. You think they talk about women and age. No, the number one thing that actually women actually do to their body is mental stress. See, it doesn't affect men the same way because men actually don't have in the need for amount of progesterone as women do. And last but not least, the most importantly, get everything tested by far. So I have a surprise even for our media team. Why don't we give a test away today? I think that once again, as everybody's trying to sell you something for profit, I'm trying to give stuff away like crazy to make a difference in your life. So we're gonna take that Dutch test and I'm gonna give one away today. Now, once again, let me say this. In order to have complete hormone testing, you need a Dutch and blood work. I list the blood work that you should have done. You can take that to any place, including the lab, and just get it done, okay? Just find out your costs and stuff like that because it's important to know your cost. So now, let's do this. What we're gonna do is this, is we're going to go to our questions because we have a ton of them from what I understand. The media team is scrambling like crazy. But during that time, besides answers questions, we're gonna figure out how to give this test away today, Nancy. So I'm gonna put it on Brandon, Nancy, and Uriah and the media team's shoulders to figure out how we're gonna, I'm not gonna make it up, but we'll figure out how we're gonna give away a test. So maybe it'll be based on a person's question, but also, please do me a favor, like and share this, because maybe you like and share it and ask a question, and you will actually be the person, that, yeah, I don't know, we're gonna figure it out this way. So once again, Fancy Nancy, Brandon, everybody, so what do we have as far as, um, um, what do we have as far as our questions? Where do you want to start? You guys got a mic? Yes. Okay, so let's go. Okay, well, first of all, if, if people want a copy of that last slide Which of one? how the normal estrogen cheat sheet normal that estrogen. you just had up, the oh, list of one? like, yes. Yes. If you want that cheat sheet, just send us, um, put a comment and then. So put a comment reply. cheat sheet on there. And, and then you can. Reply to her message. And reply to the message right. and you'll get the, get the thing. Get the okay, image. yes, because yep. a lot of people are asking, can I have those things? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All right, Lindsay is Lindsay. wondering, um, would a female bodybuilder be at higher risk for breast cancer or certain types of cancers? Um, a female bodybuilder is actually, it depends, okay? Most of the time what happens with female bodybuilders, they end up more with PCOS and other testosterone-based problems because they anabolically drain their hormones. They anabolically lower the progesterone. So believe it or not, it's gonna sound funny, even though the women actually will actually be very skinny and muscular, they actually statistically will suffer probably a little bit less chance of breast cancer, but they'll, they'll deal with other hormonal and health issues because they still deplete their progesterone, but they usually deplete their estrogens also through the process. And that's why if you ever look, um, they'll say one of the risk factors of getting breast cancer is not exercising enough. Well, because exercise, once again, can help to get you to metabolize and use up those estrogens, except for in today's world, sometimes you can do too much. And when you exercise, which is on our video. Great question, Lindsay. All right. What's yes. our next one? Um, Terry was wondering, did you say to avoid flax? Yes, you need to avoid flax. Once again, now let's do this. I'm not saying flax should always be avoided. We're talking about breast cancer or any metabolizing based thing that can affect your estrogens. Now, if you have any kind of high estrogen, be careful because flax is not selective. It can actually increase your estradiol levels, which now can convert to your other metabolites. So yes, I would avoid it if you do have any estrogen problems. All right. 
So Dana said, I have a metal allergy, allergic to all metals except sterling silver. Sure. Could this affect my estrogen levels, or are you talking internally only? Um, that's a weird question. What does... Oh, if yeah. you're wearing a watch, oh my, my goodness, if you have a metal allergy, you shouldn't touch your skin. Nothing should touch your skin. Because with skin, you're gonna actually create a reaction, an inflammatory reaction that way. So I wouldn't touch them, but also, you know, obviously thank God she doesn't have a silver allergy because now actually it's one of the best antibiotic forms that we can use. But yeah, you don't wanna touch any metals either because you do absorb them. Anything you touch, you absorb. Mm -hmm. if, it, if, you take a, if you take a metal plate and rub your finger on it, um, you actually, actually rub off some of the metal and you can't absorb it. All right. Next one. Um, I had thermography done in the beginning of August, and the yep. results said my estrogen was a two, but I'm high risk. Should your estrogens be high, or could inflammation be the reason? So is estrogen being at a two, is that high or low? What does okay, that mean? let's go over this way. So let's answer this question before you know it gets any further. Um, I'm a fan of thermography, but don't listen to their reports. Because if you ever notice this, they always talk about estrogen levels and they talk about this levels. No, thermography does one thing. It looks at your inflammatory markers, which is very good. I think every woman should have that done on a regular basis. I think thermography is absolutely amazing. But these people writing these reports drive me absolutely batty because they're making assumptions. And if someone says, and they say, well, we assume this pattern because it could be high estrogen. Okay, then guess what? Get your levels done. Get them measured. Don't leave it up for chance. You know what I'm saying? Because I've actually, and I will say this very candidly, which some people that love thermography aren't gonna like. I've actually had th a, a woman had thermography done, which honestly, I want it done regular on women, so let me make that clear. But then all of a sudden you ran their labs and their hormone levels were low, they weren't high. It happens all the time. I will never, anybody that tells me that they have a test that can tell you what your estrogen levels and never do a blood, urine, or saliva test that way, it to me is inaccurate and it's misleading. What is, what is the test or how do you get the test done to look at them accurately? Well, no, like what is the accurate representation of the breast is the thermography itself. You can tell heat patterns, inflammatory patterns, but they automatically assume because breast, because estrogen is the number one thing that actually, you know, changes the breast tissue that they're looking at. And so they're almost assuming. And even if they did say estrogen, okay, Mr. Thermography or Mrs. Thermography writer, what estrogen is it? Is it E4, E2, is estriol, is estrone, estriol? estriol? See, but people mm -hmm. don't get taught enough. It's why you have to understand the biochemistry and physiology, everything, because then you can go ask appropriate questions. The reason why people say yes to natural or medical doctors is because they are convincing based on what you're going through. I don't want to do that to people. I want to give people the great representation of how these things work. And then they go, yeah, they say estrogen, we're, we're at this level, it's increased. Okay, what estrogen? And, is it, and, what, and let's say this. Let's say it's 2-methylhydroxyestrone. Well, that is a protective estrogen. What's wrong with that estrogen being high? See, they, they got to stop generalizing. So don't read those reports. Actually, just look at the pictures. All right, Shannon from the Wellness Way Watch Party is asking, what about country well water compared to city tap water? Because of the estrogen effects from pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, there's no safe water anymore. Somebody do me a favor. Somebody go out to Lake Michigan and take a sip. Actually, it's frowned against. Maybe I say yeah, bacteria. Bacteria is the last thing I'm worried about. You know what I'm saying? I'm not worried about bacteria. I'm worried about all the freaking chemicals that they've been pouring in there for years that way. So what you need to do is get some good filtration systems. We do. I bought mine. Put it on our house. Fantastic. We have them here. Would you recommend taking tamoxifen for 10 years? Um, here's what happens. I'd recommend taking tamoxifen your whole life if you have breast cancer and do nothing else. Because if you do not take responsibility, if you do not want to make the changes necessary to get your estrogen levels normal, stay on tamoxifen the rest of your life. Otherwise, you'll probably get cancer again and die quickly. I know it surprises everybody. Like, what? He's telling to take tamoxifen? Yes. Because there's people, this is not a joke. This is totally not a joke. It's going to floor people, but it's time to get real with you people. Is the fact that I don't sympathize when people die. I don't, especially when they die from preventable habits. My, da my dad had chronic heart disease, and guess what happens? He died at 55 years old. Yeah, he was fat and overweight and, for example, had clogged arteries. And you feel sorry for him? I'm sorry. My media team's going, oh, come on, let's have some real conversations. 
The, w- the women asked my wife, it was kind of cool, it was a great question, about, you know, are you ever embarrassed about what your husband says? Well, can't, well, if you see what I see every day with the sexual imperformance of men that can't perform in the bedroom and with the women not having any sex drives and, and, and vaginal dryness and, and all these problems and somebody's worried about embarrassing or saying something that may offend somebody, get a life. Get a life. Because you know why? If you, for example, don't want to make the changes, stay on tamoxifen because it'll give you a little longer life. Isn't that funny? I just told you to stay on medication because it'll help you live longer. Because, but that's, yeah, you'll cause our problems and stuff like that, but the idea is this. But if you don't make the changes and get off tamoxifen, it's going to be a bad day. It's going to be a bad day. So well, That question was from Jacqueline, and she said thank you for the response. You're welcome, hon. So. You want something? Right. I'm giving away two hormone tests. Jacqueline needs a hormone test. All right, There's Jacqueline. One. Thank you for that question, you get Jacqueline. A hormone test. And thank you for your response and not being offended. Actually, take it back. I hope you're offended because offending people <laughs> think gets them to change their thinking. So next time someone tells you don't, you shouldn't be offended, you should be offended. So Jacqueline, you want a test. That's 350 awesome. bucks out of my pocket. Wow. But I proudly give it to you. Joan says if you're, um, Jacqueline, send us a direct message so we can get that sent thank out you, to you. Um, Joan said, if your doctor says you have 100% estrogen levels, what do you take or do for it? So this, I'm still wondering if you can just clarify what kind of testing to do to find out what your estrogen levels are at. Ladies, do me a favor. It's really simple. I'll have Nan- Fancy Nancy and Brandon post it in your eyes and stuff like that. Just get two tests done. Get the blood work done. Remember, you don't need a wellness way. You don't need anybody to get your labs done. You say, Sam, do you understand if, if you guys weren't so worried about insurance, you get everything done really cheap, okay? But actually having insurance costs, uh, allows the cost to go up because they bill a third party and you don't see the cost, but you do. Do you say, Sam? So the idea is this, get the blood work done, get the urine work done, get your labs done. It's that simple. Get them done, those two. That'll give you a great representation of what's happening. Okay. All right, does oxycodone and those types of drugs cause cancer? Okay, so let's do this. Smashing your big toe causes cancer. Let me say again. Smashing your big toe causes cancer. Let me show you how. Because this is something we just got to talk about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. Let me show you how smashing your big toe can cause cancer, okay? Because here's what happens. Here's what the people that put their head in the sand actually do. Well, I'm just gonna do anything because they say everything causes cancer. Well, let's walk through it, okay? Let's walk through what her question was, okay? Does this cause cancer? Well, let's do this. Anything that causes your biochemistry to be thrown off, either your progesterone levels or your estrogen levels can result into some hormonal induction of cancer. That means if progesterone goes low and even just your estrogen levels stay normal to your body, it's elevated because it doesn't have a counteracting hormone to balance it out. So that's why I've always screamed about women in mental stress because their progesterone is directly connected. It's why I actually said, listen, if cortisol gets out of control, progesterone is going to be affected. So the fact that anything that stresses a woman's body out, especially males are a little different. But, but, but very similar in some aspects. But the idea is this, will actually dramatically change a woman's levels and they can actually get cancer. So if you smash your toe, inflammation goes up. You smash your toe, you're mentally stressed out. So of course it can. See, but the idea is this, is that's why it's important not to blame estrogens or progesterone on cancer or not having cancer. It's maintain them so your body can adapt and change to all the environment the best it can so you don't develop in the first place. So. Answer, did I answer that correctly? So say, doc, so that medication, do you understand that medication is a toxin? It messes with your liver. So now you know that this whole process can be changed and therefore they say it can cause hormonal disruptions. They say it can cause immune disruptions, but what does that turn into eventually? Cancer, all right, next. All right, Jennifer, recently had a mammogram and they found cysts. Should yep. I be concerned that this yes. could lead to something more? Absolutely. You, the, the cysts, for example, show that there's already some abnormal changes going on. You should be very concerned. Once again, now because medicine thinks like the fire department, 
because they don't deal with you till you catch on fire. Their idea is we will just watch it. We will observe it. That's like doing this. That's like if this wall started to rot, I'd just sit there and hang out and say, yeah, eventually you could crumble. Then when it crumbles, oh my goodness, my goodness. Do you know that, that, that if you don't, don't uh, do this therapy, it's going to crumble again. You didn't even rebuild it. You left, a, you left a wall that stopped crumbling. You put some, put some boards there to, to prop it up. That's our healthcare system, guys. Think about it. And we accept this as normal. We call them real doctors. I'm just tearing on the guy that you know, sent me an email, said I was a real doctor. I'm like, I don't care if I'm a real doctor. Because you know why? Real doctors led to all this. Okay? All right. Carla, yep. does wearing a bra increase risk of breast cancer? Um, here's what I'll say. Any tissue that gets damaged and cannot repair properly can actually have some mutations. So bras, once again, are actually known to actually affect certain women. Actually, obviously, the bigger boobs they have, the more compression that they do, and therefore it can change blood flow and oxygen, change hormone levels, change mutation, and there has been some research done that can have an effect on it. It's why the no bra movement has actually been very popular. So. Ladies, I have a little thing. This is my personal thing. Let them hang loose, baby. Do you have what I'm saying? I just, I would rather see women not wear bras. Okay? And if you do wear a bra, wear something that, for example, doesn't cause a lot of compression. And I know, ladies, I, your shirts, your shirts you wear, you know, for example, you have the slit down here and then you're smashing those buggers up. And some of you guys would have to have your slit down to your belly button to, to slash them up. And so it's like, you know, I'm just sorry, it's like, don't, don't do that. It actually can cause some, here, you know, it's, it's like this. They've shown this. A guy that wears broxers compared to the wears whitey tighties actually has less uh, sperm production because the heat and the compression on testicles. You know what I'm saying? It's why, for example, you gotta watch out of damaging tissue that way, okay? Hang loose. <laughs> Hang loose, great advice. Cynthia, breast implants, can they cause cancer? Okay, once again, anything foreign to the body puts stress and biochemical changes on the body. You know, once again, you know, I get it, ladies. I really do. The narcissistic aspect of a man looking at boobs and what kids do to them, I, 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 I know why women do it, because they lose their confidence as their body changes. And, and I think that's why I want to have conversation with men and, and actually let them know that women, and this is the one thing, Nancy and all the team came in, and I was listening to all political stuff, because you guys don't realize I'm obsessed with political stuff. I think it's awesome. And when men and women, and when these ridiculous people say men and women are the same, it is such an empirical lie. When men and women are not the same. Me, Brandon, and Uriah here, we think we're awesome all the time. We, yeah, even the guys are like, hell yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like, Nancy, regardless of anything, regardless of how much weight she lost and what she looks like and things like that, she still has the confidence of a cockroach. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like they scramble and run the minute the lights are turned on. Okay? That even happens in the bedroom with women. We're going to talk about that tomorrow night. It's, for example, it's like that does happen. Okay? Because women are much more insecure by nature. So I understand why women do so many cosmetic surgeries, and we have to tell our women, stop it. Stop it. It's causing major problems. Breast implants, yes, ladies, I know. My wife had four kids. Do you Sam? Those, those uh, um, breasts of theirs became erogenous zones and turned into public utilities when you had kids. Okay? They're not the same. And a real man understands they're not the same. And so I look at women that want to get breast augmentation surgery done. Now, I understand if there is some problem and they want to just, maybe they're too large or maybe it's things like that, that's fine. But to actually put breast implants that can now cause infections, that now can get mold increase, that can do all the things like that, just isn't worth it. So... My opinion, but I think I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> How do you reduce estrogen and raise progesterone in a postmenopausal woman? Uh, number one, first find out where your estrogen levels are at because the estrogen levels, there's multiple in that way. Progesterone reduce chronic inflammation and stress. The number one thing that drains progesterone is chronic inflammation and mental stress. Get your foods tested, see where cortisol levels are at, see where mental stress is at, things like that. It's really not that difficult. It's just that it's difficult to the medical profession because they don't think like us. Um, do you recommend to take DIM plus estrogen metabolism supplement? Okay, let's do this. DIM, no. 
Now, let me explain. So I had a woman, um, actually I've known her. She's one of my sister's friends. She lives out west, okay, my, my sister, Natalie. And I'm gonna talk about this woman, I won't say her name. But the idea is this, is she got the advice of a natural practitioner because she was gaining weight and she didn't know why. And so she took DIM for a long period of time, which for once again, is a concentration of certain cruciferous at such a high potency that when it's happened, it pushes that one pathway and gets estrogens metabolized a little bit. So then all of a sudden, guess what? She's like, doc, I've been taking, I've been having a lot of problems. My husband said, you gotta call Dr. Flynn. So she called me and, I, and she would tell us she was going through, I said, you're just going through estrogen down, or insufficiency problems and she's only in her 30s. And she's like, what? I said, let's go take a look at your levels. And we tested her and guess what happened? They were significantly low. And she was taking a supplement. So ladies, be careful. See, it's hard to eat too many cruciferous vegetables. It really is. Because you'll get full and you just won't want them anymore. You can take DIM at a really high level. And I'm a fan of DIM if your levels are tested. If your levels are tested. But you can take DIM and that one pathway is not off. It won't help you a darn bit. See, it all comes back to understanding what every woman's body is at. And somebody tell me there's any two women that are saying, clinically, I will look at you and call you a liar right to your face. Because there is not. So don't take any supplement long term without having proper guidance. Um, can you get breast cancer from deodorant? Here's what happens. Antiperspirants, once again, had heavy metals in there. They can have an estrogen effect and affect your breast tissue, but based on toxicity levels that way, okay? It's why, once again, you want to use some things, cosmetics on your skin that your body can eat and use as a nutrient. And most antiperspirants and all that are not. Any antiperspirant is not. Remember, antiperspirant, stop per 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 perspirating. The metals absorbed into the cells stop it from working. That's not a good thing, okay? So the idea is this. So once again, can they have a big contributing factor? Absolutely they can. All right, two, um, two easy questions here. What time are you going live tomorrow night? It'll be 9 p.m. tomorrow night. Okay. And we're gonna talk about some cool sex stuff. All right. And just Actually, to did, should I give you a little prelude? Sure. Literally, this has happened a long time. Actually, women are saying, uh, um, and they're, they're Facebooking my wife and I and things like that. They're going, um, my, you know, when you, when you actually talk about this stuff, you, you know, when I watch you and your wife in the bedroom that way, my husband will watch and then he's better and stuff like this. And it's like, and so they're trying to get their husbands to watch this stuff, but guys don't really, aren't really cared about the educational stuff that way. But you talk about sex, it perks guys up, okay? So we've gotten a ton of things talking about, and really what happens is this, it's not a joke. It's not, you want hair. Watch this, I talk about mental stress, okay? Do you understand that if you stimulate a woman right, man, you wanna talk about hormonal balancing? Not a joke, not a joke. You can actually stimulate a woman, actually sexually, that can make her hormones balance better than anything. You understand? Know and uh, that's a topic that most men don't wanna talk about because that actually takes time. And ladies, this is what I mean. Once again, you know, your engine does not get revved up as much as us our, our guys do. Because our biochemistry basically says, if you walk into a certain circumstance, a guy gets excited. Man, think about it this way. You know, a guy basically could be at work and have a, have a, have a room and your wife walks in and shuts the door to talk to you. And the first thing the guy's thinking about is, man, can I have sex with my wife in this office? <laughs> okay? And women are laughing going, yeah, I've been through that, but I don't want to do that. It's not the right circumstance. See, that's the thing. To a guy, we're like, who cares? Shut the door and lock it. No, it's my place to work. And the guy's like, who cares? You know? And see, every guy and every woman's laughing right now because they know it's true. And it puts a woman in an uncomfortable process. But you'd be surprised. A woman could be at her home and be under a very uncomfortable process. And guys, you didn't even have to create that. The freaking little kids could have been driving her freaking nuts all day. Work could have stressed her out. All these things. See, we're not, we're, we're not programmed this way. We're not, as guys. But if guys don't understand that and what's needed to do with a woman, let's wonder why their sex life suck. Okay? So 9 p.m. tomorrow night. Get your man on there. 9 p.m. tomorrow. And as far as posting for testing, we have a number of people asking what to do for testing. 
Yep. Is that the thyroid get the, with get hormone the two, yes. panel? The thyroid hormones with, uh, with the Dutch test. Make sure you get your insulin levels, the one that has the insulin levels on. Yep. Yep. This has insulin and yep. A1C. Okay. A1C, yep. You got her. Perfect. Post I that will right now. post that. How often should you retest? Depends on your circumstance. See, once again, I'm a big tester, but some people can get away once a year. Some people can't get away with every, need every six months. Um, if you are doing the right things, you probably get once every year. Just like I do with my wife. Just like I do with my daughters. A lot of people ask about water purifiers. Water purifiers? Um, there's some really good water purifiers out there, and let me say this, I have no ties to them. I can post some links on there about it, which we use. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I think it's Radiant Life has a good one. There's a couple of them. I mean, there's local people. There's, I can yeah. actually Berkey I'll post some. Berkey is another yeah. one. Yeah, so there's great water filters out there. Just let me say this again. I have no ties to them. I just will always share with you the products I use as far as that and what I do for my house and my household and things like that. So a lot of people ask my wife, like, what cosmetics you use and what shampoos. We, yeah, we don't own the company. We don't have any connection to them. So we just like them because, once again, non-toxic, healthy stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right, how do you get rid of the cysts in your breasts? They've been following them for years and I have several of them. Yeah, okay, just think of it this way. Cyst itself, it's, a, it's an increase in formation of tissue. You gotta look at the levels that actually, that actually create that. She's gonna have estrogen problems, she's gonna have progesterone problems, she's gonna have inflammatory problems that way. Get those measured, that's the thing. And reverse that process. That's what a trained uh, practitioner knows what to do. But you gotta get tested first. All right, I keep having people tell me to put my teenage daughter on birth control. Yeah, because that's the current level of thinking. So let's go through this. Birth control, endocrine disrupting. Well, which one do you want for your daughter? Cancer or infertility? It's actually two major side effects listed on the package. And what they mean is this. Here's what I want you to tell you about this. Somebody tell me that has had a daughter, okay, that actually just trusted their doctor and tell me that their teenager isn't suffering from PMS and all the other problems. Especially nowadays, because the pediatrician vaccinated like crazy, told you to eat food too early, told you sugar is okay, told you that food moderation is okay, let them up. Do you understand this? I'm going to offend even more people right now. So I went to the volleyball game last night, my daughter's volleyball game, okay? My, and, and here's what happens. And it's not a joke. If you watch volleyball players today, their clothes are very tight. Do you understand that the majority of those kids playing volleyball were morbidly obese? And these are seventh and eighth graders. Do you really think when those girls hit their cycle that they're gonna have good periods? And it's wonder why birth control is accepted as normal. That should scare the hell out of you. Did you ever research what it does? No, my doctor said, I'm gonna say right now, your doctor is causing you to think wrong and it's why we are so unhealthy today. And if I'm wrong, why, are the, why is it the way it is today? Is it genetics? Oh my goodness, stop that. See, it's your responsibility, it's your habits that cause your genes to respond. You know what I'm saying? It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. With saline implants, how often do you need to get a mammogram or do you need to get one at all? Okay. If you look at the purpose of mammograms, if you look at the procedure, let's go through this. What is the procedure if they find any kind of dense tissue? Because mammograms do not find cancer. Let me say it again. Mammograms do not find cancer. It's a screen tool. And here's what happens. Do you understand that the, that the University of Wisconsin Medical School, before mammograms existed, do you know what they used? It's documented quite well. Thermography, look up its history. But even thermography misses a bunch of things. Okay, so I'm not saying thermography is perfect either. But what I'm saying, there's other diagnostic tools of today. And on top of it, here's what happens. There's certain blood work that you can do, like CA2729, different things like that. There's, there's other blood work that can be done to see if the tissue is even changing before thermography or before mammogram. And on top of it, here's what happens. If mammogram, they find a dense tissue on, what do they go for? They go for a what? An ultrasound, an MRI, much better technology to see what it is. And then, then from there, they do some biopsy that way. Mammogram is ancient destructive procedure. Stop them. Stop it. Do you understand that breast cancer, one of the major things, exposure to radiation. The amount of radiation you get from one mammogram. But my doctor said, well, why is you ultrasound? Why don't you just do a breast ultrasound? Well, they won't do breast ultrasound unless they find some dense tissue. Why? Procedure. 
not controlled by the doctor, controlled by the people above. And mammograms, once again, are very expensive. All cells are not. Mm -hmm. Strong procedures. Lydia is wondering what helps women with mental stress health? What helps with mental stress? You know what's really funny, Nancy, Uriah, Brandon, everybody? I've been thinking about that a lot. I honestly think about that a lot. I'm going to be vulnerable to all you guys right now. And I'm not joking. I've not had this conversation with my team. I've not had this conversation with anybody. And some of that besides, I haven't had this conversation with my wife. But I've been really talking about this a lot. And Christy is a person I'd share everything with right away. But I've been thinking about this a lot because, think about this, guys. I mean this sincerely. People say, Doc, do you have stress? Yeah, shit pisses me off every single day. I want to kill somebody at least once a day. I do. I really do. People say, and it's not a joke. I mean, there's people that do dumb stuff. There's people that do dumb business stuff. There's things that, it just happens. You know what I'm saying? But people say, Doc, you don't see, be too affected by it. Oh, don't think I'm not affected by it. It's just that what happens is this, is the first thing I actually do, no joke, is pray. It's not a joke. It's the first thing I do. And then it's really funny. It's like this. I kid you not. I'm being totally honest and vulnerable to you. I can honestly tell you, the thing that brings me the most peace in this world, believe it or not, with the exception of my faith, is my wife. Man, I'll tell you, when you can just go home or she comes here, when she just even walks in my presence, it's just like my whole body just relaxes. You know what I'm saying? And it's almost tear jerking in a way because, you know, it's not a joke. It's like, it's like, it's almost like, you know, my answer to prayer, it always seems like this. I'll, I'll literally be praying, and for some reason, my wife will call, she'll show up, and you're on. And besides that, the biggest thing that brings me peace is all you guys, is the people around me. I'm surrounded by amazing freaking people. So I don't really stress out that much, because I can walk by Kim, my CEO, have a conversation with her, and I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll, Relax. I can walk by Doc Jason. I can walk by Greg. I can walk by Ryan. I can walk by Nancy. I can walk by Ross. I can walk by all these people. And it's really funny. So what happens is, does, do things happen? Sure. But I pray and it seems like God put people in my life, especially my wife, and it's just a mental peace for me. It is. So I think the greatest thing, Lydia, that can actually, number one, relationship with your faith, you know what I'm saying? But the thing is this, but then he puts people in your place that just bring goodness to you. You're saying, yes, there are shitty people out there. I deal with them. I do. Man, think of this way. I get hate mail. The people don't even know me. I get people that think I'm Satan who walk this planet. You say, I'm, but you know what stuff that is this? It doesn't really affect me too much because the biggest stress we ever have uh, is not only one skin. My faith in Jesus Christ and then my wife and then all the people around me. My personal opinion, that's me. I've always said, you can't do anything great without other great people, but those other people kind of make you great too. Okay? Next question. All right. Let me see what we have. After that, I don't know what to ask. After that, well, maybe we should do this. Maybe we should end on that. Maybe we should end on that. Guys, I mean this sincerely. Let me flip over here real quick. You know, I say this repeatedly and I will say this till I'm nauseam. We need to stop listening and start learning. The stuff that I will consistently put out on a regular basis is to deal with the things that you can actually consume and wrestle with and see if what I do makes sense and learn something that way. Don't listen to me. Look at what I said is, is actually factual. Look what I said is replica. Look if I can give you some action steps that actually are gonna help you move in your direction that now I will change the perspective that you have because that is the key. That's what gets me up in the morning to do these things on a regular basis. I was here this morning at 3.45 a.m. preparing for you guys. I prepare all week. We do these things because, so I can give you a message that you can listen to and then learn from it. Because once again, if all we do is listen and say, Dr. Flynn said, it's no different than you saying, my doctor said. I don't want you to do that. I want you to Stop listening and start learning so now you can change the direction of your life. So my name is Dr. Patrick Flynn. I want to thank you so much for listening to my perspective on breast cancer. God bless. You guys have a beautiful day.
Hey, thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. Also, share this video with a friend. Once again, thank you for watching.